If you were around during the days that Diddy went by the name of Puff Daddy, you probably remember that he got the world jiggy with it. Indeed, during the second half of the 90s, Bad Boy Records dominated the music industry with a constant flow of hits that took dance floors and radio stations by storm, and with extravagant videos that featured lots of explosions and shiny suits, Diddy's protégés dominated TV airwaves as well. However, behind the colorful facade, some shady dealings were happening, and rumors about Diddy's treatment of artists were circulating. As the years went by, a ridiculous number of bad boy artists ended up broke, dead at a young age, or in jail for a long time. Furthermore, an inordinate number of artists who worked with Diddy quit the industry and dedicated their lives to religion. What happened? What did they witness? Was it some sort of Hollywood sacrifice? I mean, we are about to find out. Notorious B.I.G. There is no bad boy story without mentioning the legendary Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> Close to three decades after his death, to this day, one can deny Biggie's talent or lasting appeal. A supremely skilled MC and charismatic performer operating at the highest level in the most fruitful period of hip-hop's existence and sure to go down in any fan's top three of all time list. <laughs> he had the best producers in the genre at his disposal and rapped in a way that seemed light years ahead of most competitors. His debut LP, Ready to Die, sold by the absolute shedload. And that was the problem. <laughs> when Congressman Hakeem Jeffries quoted one of his district's most famous residents during Donald Trump's impeachment hearings in January 2020, it illustrated the influence the notorious B.I.G., born Christopher Wallace, has left on American culture. It has been 27 years since his death, but the hip-hop superstar's meteoric rise to fame in the early and mid-1990s and all-too-sudden murder left a legacy not only in Jeffries' district or in hip-hop culture, but in modern-day urban America. Despite recording only two albums during his lifetime, his second released less than three weeks after his murder, the notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Smalls, became one of the greatest musicians of his era and helped reshape the young hip-hop music genre. Though Biggie's legacy was cemented with his skills as an MC, it was a mountainous climb for the Brooklynite to become a legend. His early life saw him deal with the effects of living without a father during the heights of New York's crack cocaine epidemic. Even after finally hitting it big, his short career as a star was marred with legal troubles, coastal rivalries, and a feud with a former friend that ended in both their untimely murders. The stereotypical story for a hip-hop artist usually includes a single mother household, a childhood of living in a low-income area of a major city, and growing up around gang violence or drug dealing. The notorious B.I.G. was no exception, Christopher George LaTorre Wallace was born on May 21, 1972, in Brooklyn, New York, to Valletta Wallace, a Jamaican preschool teacher, and Selwyn George LaTorre, a welder and Jamaican politician. When the future hip-hop star was just a toddler, his father left the family, leaving Valletta to care for her son as a single mother. According to Classic Hip Hop magazine, Selwyn had already married another woman by the time he left his wife and son. In his song, The What, from his debut album, Biggie mentioned his father's disappearance from his life. Ready to die, why do I act that way? Pop Duke left Mom Duke, the F Fagot took the back way. Though he was born and raised in Brooklyn, Biggie's Jamaican ancestry occasionally came out in his music. He used Jamaican slang words such as blood clate and lamb's bread on his songs, and also appeared as a featured artist on the remix to the song Dolly My Baby by popular Jamaican DJ Supercat. The music video for his song One More Chance featured popular Jamaican dancehall and reggae singer Patra. Long before he donned the names Biggie Smalls and the notorious B.I.G., Biggie was big in another way. He struggled with his weight going all the way back to his elementary school days, which earned him his childhood nickname, Big. He eventually incorporated this into his MC name. 15 years after his murder, the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office released his autopsy report, which indicated, per CNN, that the rapper weighed 395 pounds at the time of his death. The coroner wrote he was morbidly obese, according to NME. At times, the rapper's weight played to his advantage in his life. Aside from using it as his MC names, the notorious B.I.G. and Biggie Smalls, he also discussed his weight in his songs. 
One of his most successful songs was the second single from his first album, Big Papa. In an early recording when he was still underground, Guaranteed Raw, the teenage MC called himself the heavyset brother from Fulton Street. In 1994, in an unreleased verse for the song Runnin' Dying to Live by his friend and soon-to-be rival Tupac Shakur, Biggie wrote the lyrics, Run from the police picture that none, A, I'm too fat, I fuck around and catch an asthma attack. An asthma inhaler was found in his pocket during his autopsy, The Atlantic reports, indicating that the lyric wasn't fiction. According to an interview he gave to the New York Times in 1994, Biggie entered New York's drug dealing scene at the age of 12. His mother worked as a preschool teacher during the day and attended night school, leaving little time to look after her son or notice his new career. In the interview, Valletta Wallace said she was unaware of her son's activities and only learned through his music. I found out about my son and his little antics through his music and through magazines, she said. I read this thing and said, huh, I never knew. Biggie said he dealt close to his home on Fulton Street between St. James Place and Washington Avenue, while his mother worked during the day. He also noted that many of his buyers personally knew him and his mother. My customers were ringing my bell and they would come up on the steps and smoke right here. They knew where I lived, they knew my mom's. The preteen Biggie had entered the drug world at the height of New York's crack epidemic. According to a 1989 New York Times piece analyzing the epidemic, studies found that in 1986, there were about 182,000 regular users of the drug. The rapper would have been 14 at the time. By 1988, that number had more than tripled to about 600,000. The article also stated that in 1988, 38% of the year's 1,867 murders had to do with drugs. Valletta wanted her son to attend the Roman Catholic Bishop Laughlin Memorial High School, a private school. The young Wallace went, but eventually transferred to George Westinghouse Career and Technical Education High School. Notably, the school's alumni included some of the top rappers of the era, DMX, Jay-Z, and Busta Rhymes. During an interview with Fuse, Busta Rhymes reminisced on his time in high school with Biggie as a classmate. Big wasn't really into rhyming in school. I never seen him really rhyme in school. I didn't know Biggie rhymed in school, cause in school we was cutting a lot of class and we was smoking a lot of weed and bullshit. In an interview with Vibe, Valletta discussed her son's time in high school. Christopher did very well in high school. It's just that he talked back a lot, Valletta said. He was a smart act. She recalled one episode when her son asked her how much a garbage collector made. When he learned that, on average, garbage collectors made more than teachers, he bragged about it to his teacher, who'd previously insulted Big by telling him in the class that some of them would end up garbage collectors. Despite being a good student and having classmates who shared his interest in hip-hop, the teenage Wallace often skipped school. At the age of 17, he dropped out. After dropping out of school, Big became a full-time drug dealer and occasional rapper on the streets of his neighborhood. An example of his early hip-hop talents was captured on video as early as 1989 when he was 17. Unfortunately for Biggie, his new career often led to trouble with the authorities. According to Biography, the same year his famous neighborhood freestyle was recorded, he was arrested on weapons possession charges and given five years of probation. The following year, he was arrested for a probation violation. In 1991, while in North Carolina, he was busted for dealing cocaine and spent nine months in jail while trying to make bail for his release. Even after making it big as a hip-hop superstar, legal trouble seemed to always follow the rapper. Throughout 1996, while working on his second album, Biggie was in the police's crosshairs. In March, he was sentenced to 100 hours of community service after being arrested for chasing two autograph seekers and allegedly threatening to kill them. Later that year, officers found four automatic weapons and 50 grams of marijuana in a raid of his New Jersey home. During the summer of 96, he was charged for allegedly beating and robbing a friend of a concert promoter in New Jersey, and that fall, he was arrested again in Brooklyn for smoking marijuana in his car. Following nine months locked up in North Carolina for dealing cocaine, Biggie released a demo. Though this would seem to indicate a change and a desire to take music more seriously, the rapper didn't think much of music as a career, saying, it was fun just hearing myself on tape over beats. Still, his skills and potential were undeniable. In March 1992, Biggie was featured in the Sources column about unsigned, talented rappers. 
Donning the name Biggie Smalls after the character of the same name in the 1975 film Let's Do It Again. Wallace was one of the top underground rappers in the city. This caught the attention of Uptown Records producer and executive Sean Puff Daddy Combs, who attempted to sign a deal with the young rapper, but was soon out of Uptown Records after a falling out with founder Andre Harrell. By the middle of 1992, Diddy started his own label, Bad Boy Records, and made Biggie one of his first big acts on the label. While the young Diddy worked to get attention to his label and his new stars, Biggie began to worry about money, as he'd had his first child, a girl named Tiana, in August 1993 with his high school sweetheart. Biggie went back to dealing drugs in order to support his new family, but he was soon forced to stop by Puffy. While working on his first album as a member of Bad Boy Records, Biggie came across one of the top artists in the world, Tupac Shakur. Tupac had already released two critically and commercially successful albums by 1993, and the pair grew close as Pac acted as a mentor and older brother figure to the up-and-coming rapper. According to Vice, Biggie would sleep on Tupac's couch when he traveled to Los Angeles, and Shakur would spend time in Biggie's neighborhood when he was in Brooklyn. At one point, Biggie questioned whether he should stay with Diddy and Bad Boy Records, to which Pac responded, Nah, stay with Puff. He will make you a star. The Dear Mama hitmaker also gave advice to Biggie on his first album, saying, If you want to make your money, you have to rap for the bitches. Do not rap for the nookays. Pac said, The betches will buy your records. On September 13, 1994, Ready to Die was released to the public. Within two months, the album was certified gold. Ready to Die was lauded for the semi-autobiographical tales from his wayward youth, and was seen as New York returning to the forefront of hip-hop after the late 80s and early 90s were dominated by the Los Angeles and West Coast area. Tupac's advice seemed to work, as Biggie's first top 10 hit song came in March 1995 with the love jam Big Papa, peaking at number six per billboard. But Biggie's friendship with Pac didn't last for long. On November 29, 1994, Tupac was shot multiple times in an act of armed robbery in the Quad Studios lobby. Biggie and others were upstairs waiting for the arrival of the rapper. Following the shooting, the California Love hitmaker accused Diddy and Biggie of orchestrating everything, ending their friendship. First, a little context. Back in 1991, former NWA member Dr. Dre and record executive Sue Knight united to form Death Row Records in Los Angeles. The label's early success saw the West Coast take the reins from the East Coast as hip-hop's center. Only two days after he was shot, Tupac was convicted of first-degree SIUAL abuse and was sentenced to 18 to 54 months in prison. This was the main reason why he was in New York when he was shot, and it led to another major event of this period. Sug Knight posted $1.4 million to get the troubled rapper out of jail and quickly signed him to death row. At the Source Awards in August 1995, Knight took a not-so-subtle shot at Diddy, insinuating that he was taking attention from his artist in his award acceptance speech. Death Row rapper Snoop Dogg also had a contentious moment at the show, asking the audience, the East Coast don't got no love for Dr. Dre or Snoop Dogg? Following his signing to Death Row Records that autumn, Tupac released the song Hit Em Up, a diss track toward his former friend Biggie and other people associated with Bad Boy Records, in which he also claimed to have slept with the rapper's wife, singer Faith Evans. Evans later denied this to MTV. In the music video of Two of America's Most Wanted featuring Snoop Dogg, exaggerated actors were hired to play Biggie and Puffy in a sketch. The continued East Coast and West Coast rivalry came to a violent climax on the night of September 7, 1996, when Suge Knight and Tupac Shakur were shot in a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas. Tupac died six days later. According to Faith Evans, Biggie called her the night Tupac died, and she said his voice was low and small and that he had been crying. She told Slate that her husband said this, Something ain't right, Faye. She got fucked up somewhere along the way, but that was my nipple Pac's death and Diddy's involvement in it was just the beginning of a terrible spell for Biggie at Bad Boy. While working on his second album, Life After Death, Biggie and his friend, 
rapper Lil Cease, were involved in a near-fatal car crash. After being arrested for smoking marijuana in the autumn of 1996, the duo had to obtain a rental car. The car, a Chevrolet Lumina, was known for having brake problems. This frightened Cease, but Big ignored his friend's objections. According to Classic Hip Hop magazine, the duo almost hit the dealer heading out of the rental lot before crashing the car on the rainy highway, leading to a broken leg for the rapper and a broken jaw for Lil Cease. In an interview Lil Cease gave to Vlad TV, he said that the injury forced Biggie to spend three months in the hospital and required six months of therapy to recover. The incident also influenced the lyrics of the Life After Death album, according to Cease, who said the injury and time in the hospital was a reality check for B.I.G. On the song The Long Kiss Goodbye, the future Hall of Famer rapped about the incident, saying, You still tickle me, I used to be as strong as Ripple B, till Lil Cease crippled me, as Cease was the driver the day of the accident. The accident also forced Biggie to use a cane to get around. This can be seen in the music video for his single Hypnotize, made days before his murder. And now to the tragic turn, six months after the murder of his one-time friend and rival Tupac Shakur, Biggie traveled to Los Angeles to promote the release of his second album and record the music video for his single Hypnotize. While in LA, the rapper told San Francisco's KYLDFM that his high profile made him concerned about his safety. Unfortunately, his concern would be well warranted. On March 7th, while the rapper was presenting an award at the 1997 Soul Train Music Award show, boos could be heard, illustrating the continued anger of the coastal feuding. The next night, he and his entourage, including Diddy, Lil Cease, his wife Faith Evans, and others, attended an after-party hosted by Vibe Magazine and Quest Records. During the early hours of March 9th, Biggie was in the front seat of his ride as he was leaving the party. In an event eerily similar to Tupac's murder, the SUV was stopped at a red light when another vehicle rode beside them and opened fire into the SUV, hitting the rapper four times. Unfortunately, Biggie was pronounced dead at Cedar sinai Medical Center about a half hour after the drive-by shooting at only 24. Like the death of Tupac, the murder has yet to be solved, though Valletta Wallace told the Mercury News she believes that the Los Angeles Police Department knows who killed her son. Life After Death, the Notorious B.I.G.'s second album, was released 16 days later to critical and commercial acclaim. Diddy has been faulted for causing the rapper's death and later profiting off his work. Craig Mack. The second artist who certainly picked up the bad boy curse is Craig Mack. Mack was the first artist signed with Bad Boy Records. His 1994 single, Flava In Ya Ear, went on to become the label's first hit record, helping lay its foundations for years to come. While Mack's career appeared to be on the up and up, it went down very quickly. Some might even say that his career was cursed from the start. The main reason, Diddy discovered the Notorious B.I.G., who would become one of the greatest rappers of all time and pushed Craig Mack to the side. To make matters worse, Mack's physical appearance became an issue. He was constantly the butt of ugly jokes in hip-hop media, and that followed him throughout his entire life. Furthermore, Mack was reluctant to embrace Diddy's vision for radio-friendly rap. As a result, his first album, Funk Da World, contained several tracks that were decidedly uncommercial, such as When God Comes, a sobering track that scolds the sinful ways of his generation. After spending a few years dwelling in the basement of Bad Boy Records, Mac finally split from the label in 1997. After a few failed attempts to return to the industry, the once lethal rapper disappeared from the rap world for good. In 2012, he re-merged in a video posted by the Overcomer Ministry, a secluded Christian community in South Carolina that was described as a cult by ex-members. While Mac's faith appeared to be sincere, the leader of the ministry, Brother R.G. Stair, was arrested on several charges, including touching young girls. In the following years, the rapper's health degraded radically, and he was sometimes seen walking around with a cane. In 2018, Craig Mack passed away at the age of 47 due to heart failure in South Carolina near the Overcomer Ministry. Mace. Next in line is rapper Mace. From 1996 to 1999, Mace dominated the charts, and his first album, Harlem World, went quadruple platinum. Following this enormous success, the rapper shocked the hip-hop world by announcing his retirement to become a pastor. 
On April 20th, 1999, during an interview with Funkmaster Flex on New York radio station Hot 97, Mace announced his retirement from music to pursue a calling from God. He claimed he was leading people, friends, kids, and others down a path to hell, stating that he left to find God in his heart and follow him. He said it was time for him to serve God in his way, saying rap was not real and that he wanted to deal with reality and had become unhappy with what he did, no matter how much money it had made him. At the time, Mace's retirement raised a lot of questions. What made him leave the music industry? The speculation regarding the rapper's sudden departure from Bad Boy stirred up a storm of controversy. How do you have a 19-year-old rapper named Mace who decides one day to wake up and say, you know what, I want to get out of this shot and be a minister? A former Diddy disciple told The Voice. In 1999, Mace, whose real name is Mason Betha, quit Bad Boy Entertainment and announced the formation of SANE Ministries. The acronym stands for Saving a Nation Endangered. He now calls himself Minister Maze after a soul-stirring vision from God. Indeed, at the height of his popularity, owing to the success of his Harlem World album, Mace is reportedly told one radio interviewer, Tupac, who was killed in Las Vegas in 1996, heard the call and he didn't heed the warning. Biggie heard it, he didn't heed it, I'm no fool. Some still have doubts as to why Mace left. Puffy does not let people out of their contract so easily, claims a bad boy insider. He had Mace under contract for a long time. You let somebody walk into your office and say, I don't want to be under contract no more. And you just say, okay, go ahead. I think Mase had something over him, some little secret that Puffy did not want to get out, and he used it as a bargaining chip to get out of that record deal. Going gospel may have saved Mace's life. If anybody wants to do something to you, they'll think twice, the insider asserted. When you're with the Lord, they think twice about doing you stuff. Think about it, he's the only one who got out on top. So here is the big question. What little secret did Mace have on Puffy? Time will surely tell. And then there is Shiny. In 1998, several record labels were trying to sign rapper Shine due to the buzz he generated in New York. Diddy was one of them, and he pursued him aggressively. The result? He offered the rapper millions of dollars, three cars of his choice, and two homes just for signing. After joining Bad Boy Records, people close to Shine saw a change in his demeanor. James Barnes, a friend of Shine, recalls the transformation. I said to myself, damn, that's sad. This is what happens to young people. This is a child in a candy store. Barnes felt that Shine had fallen victim to the bad boy curse. He noticed that he hung out with a different crowd. The people I saw around him were not Shine loyalists. He just seemed to evolve into this monster. Shortly after signing with Bad Boy, one of Shine's close friends died in an accident. The rapper's reaction was bizarre, to say the least. According to the story, Shine, two of his closest friends, and a cousin were driving home to Brooklyn after partying at a nightclub in Manhattan. They were all drunk. Their Mercedes-Benz crashed, fatally injuring one of the teenagers. Shine basically came out of the accident with scratches, Barnes recalls. But the word on the street was, yo, Shiny is messed up. Heard how he was acting at his boy's funeral. He was just laughing and talking. There was this terrible story in the street about how he just seemed so indifferent. Then the bad boy curse kept on giving. Shortly before the release of his first album, Shine, Diddy, and his then girlfriend, Jennifer Lopez, were involved in a shooting incident at a Manhattan club, which resulted in three people being injured. Shine was later convicted of attempted murder, assault, and reckless endangerment and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Diddy was acquitted, with Shine later implying that Diddy ratted him out to avoid jail. While incarcerated, the rapper began studying Judaism with rabbis and legally changed his name to Moses Michael Levi Barrow. In 2009, Shine was released from jail and got deported to his native Belize. He formally converted to Orthodox Judaism in Jerusalem in 2010. Since then, Shine has mostly stayed away from the music industry. In 2020, he was elected to the Belize House of Representatives. Loon. Then there is Loon. Loon released his first album with Bad Boy Records in 2003. One year later, he left the label and started his own company, Boss Up Entertainment. In 2008, after a trip to Abu Dhabi, the singer converted to Islam. Born Chauncey Lamont Hawkins, he officially changed his name to Amir Junaid Muhadith after traveling to Mecca, Saudi Arabia, 
Islam's holiest site, to perform Umrah. After having converted to Islam, he subsequently ended his music career and relocated to Egypt, where he lived until 2011. Despite attempting to turn his life around, Loon ended up in jail. Some claim that he was innocent and that Diddy set him up, just like he did with the rest of his scenies. On November 22, 2011, Loon was arrested while on a trip to Brussels. He was extradited to the United States in May 2012 and was sentenced to 14 years imprisonment in July 2013 for conspiracy with intent to traffic one or more kilograms of heroin. Many reports have advocated for and confirmed his innocence. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic effects in prison centers, the singer was granted early release on July 29, 2020. All the artists mentioned have one point in common. They were signed with Diddy, and nearly all of them ended up hating and resenting him. But what's the reason? First, nearly every artist who signed with Diddy ended up complaining about signing a slave contract. Despite their commercial success, several bad boy artists ended up poor. Diddy, born in 1969, has spent over 50 years displaying a single-minded drive for power, success, and recognition, and a refusal to back down instilled in him from childhood. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. He has described his parents as the fly guy and fly girl of their Harlem neighborhood, and both were go-getters in their own right. His father worked for the Board of Education and as a driver before his 1972 murder, after which the rapper's mother, Janice, a former model, worked four jobs to support her son and daughter, Keisha. She emphasized education, but also the importance of establishing dominance, a, a lesson she hammered home to Puffy, a ged nine when another child stole his money. My mother wouldn't let me in the house, Diddy told Oprah in a 2006 interview. She said, go back out there and get that money. And if anyone ever puts their hands on you, make sure they never do it again. She knew the reality. If people smell weakness, they take advantage of you. You have to defend yourself. Janice's lesson may also have aligned with his natural inclinations, though his future puffy moniker stemmed from childhood tantrums. Whenever I got mad as a kid, I used to always huff and puff, the now troubled Grammy winner told Jet Magazine in 1998. I had a temper. That's why my friends started calling me puffy. While Diddy clearly took his mother's advice to heart, he also mirrored her work ethic. He got his first job at 12, a paper route, then worked at a gas station and a Mexican restaurant, in addition to selling lemonade, he told Forbes. He spent a childhood summer with an Amish family in Pennsylvania through the nonprofit Fresh Air Fund for inner city kids. And it wasn't long before his mother moved the family from crowded uptown Manhattan to Mount Vernon, a suburb of Westchester County. She enrolled Diddy, who was raised Catholic and served as an altar boy at the prestigious Bronx All Boys Academy Mount St. Michael, where he wore the neat attire each day, played football, and always wanted to set his sights high. Just knew I was going to be an NFL pro player, he told the New York Times in 2012. After he broke his leg, though, young Combs had to alter his dreams, and it was at Howard that he truly began to flex his muscles of influence and impresario. Diddy, by all accounts, began making a name for himself almost immediately after heading south to D.C. to start his studies at Howard, the historically black university. He arrived at the tail end of the 1980s when New York-based hip-hop culture was preeminent, and he cashed in on that Empire State connection. He wore flashy clothes, threw parties, and began building an entourage. And between classes, he still found time to run a shuttle service to the airport, to allegedly sell old term papers, and to even hawk t-shirts and sodas, according to Ro Ronan's 2001 book, Bad Boy, the influence of Sean Puffy Combs on the music industry. After protesting students took over an administrative building, he turned newspaper and magazine clips about the incident into poster-sized collages and sold them back to the participants, Ronan writes. When Puffy came, he was a very flashy guy, the book quotes classmate, friend, and fellow undergrad promoter Derek Angeletti is saying. He was always out at the clubs, and the young girls loved him. He'd be in the middle of the floor doing all the new dances, and his style of dress was a little more colorful, bolder. Everyone took notice of this cool, overconfident young dude. I was DJing at the time, and one night he came up to me and said, I'd like to throw a party with you, you're pretty popular. The pair began organizing events that Diddy successfully lobbied celebrities to attend, 
While shrewdly including his own name on promotional materials, including the one that would make him famous. On his first business card, in the bottom left-hand corner, he had engraved Sean Puff Combs, Ronan writes. For the next two years, we threw one damn party near every week, Angeletti says in the book, including a homecoming at a Masonic temple where they expected maybe 1,500. 4,500 people came. The DC police shut down the whole block and brought out the dogs. We had to get on our knees and beg them not to lock us up. As Diddy's endeavors burgeoned, however, so did his ambition, which soon outgrew the Howard campus. He began lobbying record executives in New York for jobs, but soon lowered the ask to internships, securing one with Uptown Records' Andre Harrell, who famously coined the term Ghetto Fabulous. Puffy initially commuted weekly between college and his hometown, working 80-hour weeks as he literally ran to complete errands for his record superiors. It wasn't long before he quit Howard altogether. By 1991, Harrell had installed him as an A&R executive, and Diddy was forging a reputation for identifying and molding top-tier talent. The New Yorker displayed cross-cultural perspicacity that would become a hallmark and goldmine of his career. He threw weekly, racially mixed daddy's house parties for street kids and preppy students from Columbia University and New York University, where he saw what fans were dancing to and wearing, writes Ronan. With the help of his girlfriend, Def Jam intern-turned-stylist Misa Hilton, Diddy was dialing into street trends in the youth zeitgeist as he promoted artists such as Jodeci. But one of his trend-setting events featuring the R&B duo took a tragic turn in 1991. Diddy had helped set up a charity basketball event at Harlem's City College campus just after Christmas. But 5,000 turned up, and a stampede created a crowd crush in a stairwell and killed nine and injured around three dozen others. No criminal charges were filed, but the young executive gave testimony about the tragedy several years later in a lawsuit filed by victims against the college, describing young ladies getting squished and the panic on everybody's face. City College is something I deal with every day of my life, Diddy said outside court in 1998. But the things that I deal with can in no way measure up to the pain that the families deal with. I just pray for the families and pray for the children who lost their lives every day. Despite the incident, however, Puffy's reputation was exploding, for positive reasons. His 1992 signing of Brooklyn's Christopher Wallace, better known as the Notorious B.I.G., proved particularly momentous for both men's trajectories. Uptown's distributor, MCA Records, balked at releasing Biggie's debut album, which featured gritty songs about street life. And Harrell, forced to make a decision, cut Diddy loose. I didn't want to sit there and be the one confining Puff because the corporation was telling me to do that, Harrell, who died four years ago, told the Wall Street Journal in 2014. I'm not built that way. I told Puff he needs to go and create his own opportunity. You're red hot right now. I'm really letting you go so you can get rich. Diddy ran with it, creating his own company, Bad Boy Records, and releasing Biggie's Ready to Die in 1994. His in-house production team was called The Hitmen. But all of those monikers would soon prove horrifyingly prescient amidst the East Coast-West Coast rap feud. As mentioned earlier, Bad Boy and Diddy were involved in a rivalry with LA-based Death Row Records, a label founded a few years earlier by Suga Knight, which was riding Tupac Shakur's wave of fame in 1994, when the artist was shot five times in New York during a robbery. Pac claimed Diddy and Biggie had prior knowledge of the planned attack. They denied responsibility, but the feud is widely attributed to the unsolved deaths of both the Death Row artist, who was later fatally shot in Las Vegas in 1996, and Biggie, who was killed six months later in a Los Angeles drive-by. That night, Puffy had left the same party as Biggie in a second car, the feud, the murders, and any potential connections to Diddy remain conspiracy theory fodder to this day. Smack in between both murders, Diddy released his first single in January 1997 under the name Puff Daddy, followed by his album release that July. It included the Biggie tribute I'll Be Missing You, which sampled the police and became the first rap single to debut at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Both his personal and professional lives were growing and diversifying exponentially. In 1997, he opened Justin's, his first restaurant in New York, named after the son he and girlfriend Misa Hilton had welcomed four years earlier before they split. 
Diddy went on to date model Kim Porter, who gave birth to his second son Christian, who now goes by King, in 1998, the same year he launched the fashion line Sean John. He was nominated for five Grammys that year, and his wealth began snowballing, with Bad Boy generating $130 million. He bought a mansion in the Hamptons that year too, throwing a Labor Day white party that quickly became an annual fixture for the rich and sexy. Years later, Paris Hilton, in her trademark board drawl, remembered the first event with words that echoed those of his college admirers. It was iconic and everyone was there, she told The Hollywood Reporter. As Diddy established himself as a true business and social force, however, the behavior that earned him his nickname continued to rear its ugly head. In 1999, he was arrested on felony charges of assault and criminal mischief after beating up an Interscope Records executive during business hours at the offices of Universal Music, leaving the victim with a broken arm, broken jaw, and head wounds. The rapper pleaded guilty to a lesser harassment violation and was ordered to attend a one-day class in anger management. It didn't seem to do too much, though. Three months later, in one of the more serious and high-profile incidents of his career, and that's saying a lot, Diddy was involved in a Manhattan nightclub shooting while in the company of none other than Jennifer Lopez, whom he'd begun dating earlier that year. The couple had been celebrating at Times Square Hotspot Club New York when another patron allegedly insulted Diddy and threatened his protege, rapper Shine. A dispute ensued, shots were fired, and three bystanders were injured, including a woman who was shot in the face. The music mogul fled in a Lincoln Navigator with J. Lo, his bodyguard, and his driver, along with a stolen gun none of them had a license for, as cops found out when they stopped the car. Puffy was found not guilty in March 2001 of four counts of illegal possession of a gun and one count of bribery after a trial that doubled as a media spectacle. Proving what a force the rapper had become, fans turned up at the courthouse for seven weeks, and workers at the building, upon his acquittal, threw open the windows to chant his name and leave him alone. Diddy, who'd been visibly shaking as the verdict was read, publicly thanked God upon his acquittal and reportedly went to church. Seemingly keen to distance himself from the bad boy image, the rapper changed his name to P. Diddy just weeks after walking free from court. He released the album The Saga Continues in July, but continued pursuing new avenues. In 2001, he appeared in two movies as an actor, including Monster's Ball, which won Holly Berry an Oscar, he also began producing new artists and pushing into reality television. By 2002, he was bragging about taking his 14th flight on the Concorde and was nominated for Menswear Designer of the Year by the Council of Fashion Designers of America. However, even his wildly successful Sean Jean was not free from legal issues, weathering Honduran sweatshop allegations the following year. In a nutshell, one would spend time trying to find anyone who passed through Diddy's hands and come out unscathed, including Diddy himself, and they wouldn't find one. So, does that mean the bad boy curse is actually real? Share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. And that's it from us today. Until next time, thank you for watching.